Good evening. On behalf of the planning committee, I would like to welcome you to the 30th annual Holocaust Lecture Series. I would like to extend a special welcome to members of Nashville's Iraqi and Kurdish communities, as well as students from Tennessee State University for joining us today. How does one go about explaining and understanding genocide? A crime so horrific, so perplexing, that there was not even a word for it until 1944. That year, a Polish Jewish lawyer named Ralph Lemkin coined the term to describe an act committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethical, racial, or religious group. In doing so, he gave a name to the crimes committed by Nazi Germany. Sadly, since that time, the world has given us ample opportunities to utilize that word again and again and again. Bosnia, East Timor, Cambodia, Rwanda, Congo, prove that our understanding is incomplete. Ray Waddell of the Tennessean newspaper recently wrote, Vanderbilt's Holocaust Lectures annually throws light on a human darkness that otherwise defies explanation and resists publicity. The Holocaust Lecture Series confronts genocide first and foremost by making sure that the darkness of ignorance and silence never falls upon its victims. And second, the Holocaust Lecture Series provides a stage for new perspectives, new questions, and for conveying those narratives that have struggled to find a voice or an audience. The legal perspective on genocide is perhaps not new. It has a long tradition. As I mentioned, the term genocide was coined by a legal mind. The ideas of Ralph Lemkin formed the basis for the Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals. In 1948, the United Nations adopted the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. International courts of various stripes have been set up to deal with this crime. Most recently, the Iraqi High Tribunal, which was set up last year to deal with the genocide committed against Iraqi Kurds. Yet tonight, we have the great privilege of a truly unique legal perspective. Professor Michael Newton, Associate Professor of Law at Vanderbilt University, assisted in the drafting of the statute of the Iraqi High Tribunal and served as an advisor to the Judicial Chambers in 2006. He helped to establish the Iraqi Special Tribunal and to train its judges. Professor Newton was also the U.S. Representative on the UN planning mission for the Sierra Leone Special Court and senior advisor to the United States Ambassador at Large for war crimes issues. He has worked for the International Criminal uh, Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia on the Milosevic indictment, no less, as well as negotiating and providing documents for the International Criminal Court. In his spare time, Professor Newton has published more than 30 articles editorials, and book chapters, as well as opinion pieces for the New York Times and the International Herald Tribune. Here to discuss the Iraq genocide, personal perspectives, and legal residue, please welcome our very own Professor Michael Newton. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I see a few of my students and a few of my non-students. It's so wonderful that the community has joined us. Uh, I was really humbled to be able to be asked to share some of my perspectives tonight. Um, this is an important lecture series. I'm told this is the oldest continuous running lecture series of this sort uh, in an American university. It's, that's, I think, an important distinction because it's a serious topic for serious times. In my work with Iraqi judges and lawyers over really stretching past the uh, over seven years now, I've gained a tremendous amount of appreciation for the depth and for the sincerity and for the legal culture. It's an amazing group of people. 
uh, a, a group of people whose legal perspective and whose professional perspective is seldom appreciated outside the region. I want to talk tonight uh, a little bit about my personal perspectives and personal experiences, but I also want to get you into the personal experiences of what it was like during the on-call genocide for the victims. You hear me talk a lot about victims and a lot about testimony. Um, in my work with Iraqis and particularly Kurds, there's this very deep, almost palpable sense that justice is needed. Justice feeds the soul of the people. Uh, for the Greek philosophers, for those who are students of the Greek history, justice, the pursuit of justice, was the very highest, highest calling of mankind. It was the highest thing you could do with your life, was to pursue justice. It was the highest order of existence. In the courtroom in Baghdad, uh, we have achieved some measure of that. I assure you that in all my dealings with Kurdish judges and prosecutors, they felt a very strong weight of responsibility, not only to Iraq as a whole and to the legal system as a whole, but a very pointed responsibility towards their people, towards the Kurdish people, and, and in particular on behalf of the law. So I really salute all of you who have taken time out of your schedules to come tonight. Um, I think it's important to, to lift ourselves from our own context and from our own cultural experience and try to seek to gain some understanding that transcends boundaries. Uh, now having said that, let me pause for a what, what in other contexts you might call a major commercial announcement from our sponsors. I have some important news that I'd like to share with you, and I'm particularly happy to see some representatives of the Kurdish community, because I hope that this news, as I'm about to announce it, floods out across the Kurdish community. In a sense, I feel a little bit like John the Baptist. There's one greater than I coming after me. I have arranged, with the cooperation of the Iraqi Tribunal, on November the 28th, the entire trial panel who prosecuted and convicted the on-call genocide trial will be at Vanderbilt Law School. The entire trial panel will be here, along with the president of the court, Judge Arif al Shaheen, will be here. And in fact, following that public presentation at Vanderbilt Law School, uh, the judges of the on-call genocide trial have specifically asked us to coordinate some private activities with the Kurdish community in this area. I think that's really important, and it's a testimony to how seriously they take their responsibility to the Kurdish people and to the Kurdish ethnicity, that they're willing to travel this distance to meet with what I'm told is the largest concentration of Kurds in the United States. It's a real testimony to who they are and what they're all about. I want to leave you with a little bit of a tangible sense uh, of the legal importance of the trial itself. I want to give you a good flavor of what it was about, how it happened, what it was like for victims, how the trial itself unfolded. You can see on the map that on call, in the aggregate, consisted of eight distinct separate phases, eight separate military campaigns, which began close to the Iranian border and then gradually stretched both north and south and to the west, all the way to the Turkish border. On call eight is the one right on the, right on the line between Iraq and Turkey. Uh, the on call campaign, the term on call, really stands as a monument, as I think about it, to the savagery of man. Uh, it really eats at the heart of what we call civilization. Civilized people, law-abiding people, conducted these kinds of campaigns. And that's really the hallmark of an organized genocide, one that shocks the conscience, one that you sit back and you, from a, from a distant perspective, ask yourself, how could this happen? How could ordinary, rational people conduct this concentrated, organized, concerted, concentrated, coordinated series of attacks on other human beings. I want to expose you to that tonight, talk to you a little bit about the calculated cruelty and the deliberateness of the campaign that could only have been conducted in this context because the power of Saddam's regime shielded those perpetrators. Saddam's tyrannical power shielded them from accountability. Therefore, they felt perfectly at liberty to do what they chose to do. And in this context, to do what they had been ordered to do, no matter what it was. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the heart of genocide. Because the regime, instead of protecting people, became the engine of evil that sought to destroy them. That's the heart of what we mean when we say genocide. The textbook definition of gen genocide flows from the 1948 Genocide Convention, which I hope my students are very familiar with by now. Uh, 
the Iraqi High Criminal Court, what the Iraqis did was actually very sophisticated. They did it in the exact same way that the most sophisticated legal systems in the world have done. They took established, well-recognized international law norms, and they built it verbatim into their domestic system. So when it comes to the genocide provisions of the Iraqi criminal statute, it is verbatim, word for word, what the most sophisticated legal systems in the world have done, drawn directly from international law. The 1948 Genocide Convention is very clear, and it has been built into the legal fabric of systems all around the world. Today, the, what we call genocide, the genocide law, is an almost homogenous body of law. It is, as I say, universalized. When you say the word genocide, it carries with it a distinct set of legal meanings, a distinct set of jurisprudence, a distinct set of principles that 50 years ago were non-existent, and 10 years ago had not been developed. Today, they have been developed. And the Anfal genocide trial that just concluded in Baghdad is the latest and most notable benchmark in that jurisprudential pathway. And for that reason, just on its legal merits alone, it would be incredibly significant and worth noting. For those who are unfamiliar with the legal context of genocide, let me give you book, chapter, and verse, textbook law. Genocide means any of the following acts, and it specifies a whole series of acts. The most familiar of which, of course, you might think as murder, killing members of the group. Any specified act committed with the intent this is called dolus specialis, special intent, the intent to destroy in whole or in part. And the case law says by part it means substantial part or significant part. So any of the specified acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part one of the specified groups. The groups are defined in the following terms, racial, ethnic, national, religious. So that's the act, that's, that's the context of genocide. But there are two very, very significant words at the end. And as I tell my students, sometimes two words mean a great deal. All I need to say is, I do. And it means a great deal. The definition of genocide says, intend to eliminate in whole or in part, based on the following criteria, racial, ethnic, national, religious. And then it has a little comment, a parenthetical, and it says, as such. The core of most genocide cases, as, as was the core of this case, comes down to the determination of, of all the possible ulterior motives for the destruction or the persecution of this group, of all the range of conceivable reasons why this group could have been attacked at this place, in this area. Was it done to eliminate them in whole or in part as such, based on, caused by, in order to specifically eliminate that group? on the basis of that characteristic. That's what's required, and you can tell just from my description that it's a relatively high standard of proof. And we'll talk about that once we talk about the substance of the case. Martin Luther King once said, and I love this quote, he said, the force of God expressed in human relations is justice. And I believe that. But if you'll permit me sort of a Newton corollary to that, you might call it Newton's law, my corollary to that is, the force of God expressed in individual relations is passion. And I must tell you that in this context, many, many, many Kurds and Kurdish organizations had a tremendous passion for documenting and, and preserving what happened in the Anfal genocide. People risked their lives to collect witness statements. People risk their lives and the lives of their families to document photographs, timelines, uh, orders, papers. Everything you can think of that goes into proving criminal evidence was collected to some extent or to a large extent by the Kurds themselves. Because of the passion that said, what happened to us cannot be forgotten, it must be preserved, and one day we will seek justice. The, the point of genocide is that it's defined in terms of stable and fixed groups. These are not transient characteristics. They're not, they're not mutable characteristics. They're fixed and stable, defined characteristics of a group. The point of genocide law is that people are people, and distinct ethnic, racial, religious groups 
are entitled to exist in their own right. Now, listen closely, because I'm about to tell you the most profound thing I will say tonight. Kurdish people are people. Profound, deep thoughts. They're people. Because of that, they have a fundamental, inalienable right to exist. And in the aggregate, if their individual right to exist, which is their most fundamental, inalienable human right, in the aggregate, as a group that's co-located, that shares a common language, that shares a common culture, that shares, in some cases, common religion, that shares tribal links, that shares customs, that shares practices, that group has a right to exist. That's the core of genocide law. That's what Raphael Lincoln was defining when he defined that group. Now, you might notice the one omission, political persecution. And there's a lot of history there in terms of the negotiation of the convention, why political groups were, were excluded. It has a lot to do with Cold War politics. It has a lot to do with the realities of the era. But the fact is that the core international law definition excludes political groups. Although I might note in passing that a number of domestic states have included political genocide in their domestic statutes. They've, they've pushed the bounds of international law in that sense. The Iraqis are not in that group. The Iraqi definitions, core definitions of genocide, strictly track the international law definitions. And that's important. The most fundamental right to, to, to exist is the essential right protected by the prohibition against genocide. And I only, I'll tell you a quick story. Some of my students have heard this before, uh, but I think it's illustrative. I was in a meeting discussing the on-call genocide trial. And we're doing incredibly complex, weighty, difficult issues of international law. Very fine-tuned, and of course, translation errors and translation difficulties, and very fine components of mental conduct and mens rea discussions. <coughs> cell phone rings, and one of the Iraqi judges, of course, pulls out a cell phone and answers it. He's a little embarrassed, uh, because there's this conference and this judicial discussion. And so he talks for a little while. Um, Gets off the phone, a little bit embarrassed, a little bit red-faced, and he apologizes, and he says, that was my wife. And of course, I understand this, totally, right? You take the call from your wife. Of course you understand that, right? No problem. So then we get back into the meat of our discussions, and it takes us about another 15 or 20 minutes to get back to where we were before. There's substance. People are re-engaged. You know, we're perspectives and translations and difficulties and questions and there's this rich legal dialogue going which in fact is living proof for those outside Iraq that would say that the Iraqi jurists were not capable of such such intellectual distinctions and such fine debate. I'm living proof to tell you that's not true. Same cell phone goes off after about 20 minutes. The judge at this time is much more embarrassed. Very red. And he almost got up and walked out, but a couple of his colleagues said, go, oh, sit, please. Of course, answer the call. So he takes the call, very, very embarrassed at this point, gets off the phone, and he smiles, and he says, this was my other wife. <laughs> I, I must leave. And the point is this. As human beings, we all share fundamental characteristics of humanity. We can all relate to each other on a variety of levels. We essentially all have, fundamentally, the same sets of problems. No matter where we are, no matter what tribe we're from, no matter what religion we are, whether we're married or not, no matter what our skin color, no matter what our ethnic background, that's the core of genocide law. Because it says, you are human beings with all your foibles and follies. You have lives, you have family, you have some faith, you have a future, you have dreams. And the law says you are entitled to those. Those must be preserved. Rather than acknowledging their individuality and the preservation of their fundamental human rights to exist in peace and dignity, here's what the Iraqi regime did. It branded every curve across the swath of northern Iraq as saboteurs, as agents of the enemy as agents of Iran. And it said, in essence, you no longer have those fundamental core set of human rights. Why? Because of the legal fiction that you are all enemies of the state and therefore not entitled to live. <coughs> I don't have time tonight to adequately capture for you 
the entire scope of suffering, the entire panoply of facts that happened during the on-call genocide. The investigative judge's report that led to the trial was 9,312 pages long. The trial itself lasted over a year. The trial judgment itself is 936 pages long. And it's not been publicly released. It's full of incredibly graphic detail and testimony and context and richness. The thousands and thousands of victims who could have come to tell their stories were lying in the mass graves of Northern Iraq. But many, many, many people did come, and every one of whom spoke represented figuratively hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other almost identical stories. The facts are simple, but they defy logic. The numbers only hint at the enormity of the experience. When the trial began, in fact, we prepared a very large map. Uh, for those who have been in Baghdad, it was the size of one of the concrete bunker barriers. It was about as big as that wall. Huge, towered in the courtroom. The courtroom was so large, from the perspective of the camera, it had a relatively, but from where the trial bench was, from where the witnesses were, it towered over them. And on that map were dots, respective colored dots, that illustrated each of the villages destroyed during the on-call campaign. 2,000 villages destroyed. By some estimates, up to 200,000 victims. Some conservative estimates say 125,000, others say 200,000. Many more thousands simply disappeared. Don't know they're dead, don't know where they are, don't know what happened to them. Each one of those pins was a testimony to the conservative power of the Iraqi state that exercised every ounce of governmental power to destroy the Kurds as an identifiable, specific group. One man told being in a mass grave, he was a survivor of a mass grave, he was herded up with his family, taken to a mass grave, um, gunshots rang out, the shots silenced everybody, but he was buried under enough bodies that he survived. After they left, he, they had all been filled in with a shallow layer of dirt. He dug himself out of the mass grave, came to the court to testify. He described what happened to him when the doctors removed the bullet from his leg. That man knows what the onfall was like. Onfall was such an experience that it was genocide in the sense that it stripped the Kurds, or attempted to strip the Kurds, of everything they possessed, their possessions, their identity, their very existence as a separate people. That's what genocide is all about. That's what happened in northern Iraq. Each pin on the map represented a way of life. Among the villages destroyed, as I said, by some estimates 2,000 villages, some estimates 5,000 villages. Nobody really knows for sure. But among that is something that, as far as I know, has never been recorded in the annals of civilized history. The Iraqi regime, more than 60 documented chemical weapons attacks against their own people in their own villages. And some of you may have heard of Malabja, one of the most famous attacks of the region in 1998. Uh, Malabja actually technically wasn't part of the on-call campaign, and it was not part of the recently concluded on-call trial. So if you've heard of Malabja and you're asking yourself, won't Malabja be prosecuted? The answer, probably, but not in this trial that was just concluded, in a subsequent trial. Halabja has got a very unique set of facts. It's a unique set of law. It, it really wasn't part of the core on call, eight separate campaigns. But just in Halabja, um, over 500 people died. 500 families. Mothers died with babies in their hands as it was attacked by chemicals. The other thing that the regime did during the on call is a deliberate, calculated, specific, effort was to destroy all hint of Kurdish existence, not just the people, but the places. Villages were destroyed. They sought to destroy the physical vestiges. Day after day after day, there were orchestrated, concentrated attacks as they would surround the village. Uh, I don't know if any of you are hunters, but a standard hunting technique. You will block off a route of escape one way, and then you'll have beaters and drivers that will drive the game right into the waiting arms of the hunters. That's what happened to the, to the Kurdish people. The military would surround one part of the town. Military and paramilitary and intelligence would move into the other part of the town. People were caught in the middle. They were shipped off to death camps. 
And if they were lucky enough, some of them escaped. They would escape into the hills, come back after a few days, and find that, that their village had been utterly destroyed. Because of this policy aimed at erasing every vestige of Kurdish identity, not just as a, as a group, but every vestige uh, of their existence from the land itself. They weren't satisfied even with destroying the physical villages. Regime forces bombed water supplies. They poisoned wells. They destroyed farmland over and over and over. This was all not by accident, remember. This was orchestrated, calculated, based on orders and based on accountability. There are lots and lots of intelligence reports flowing back up the chain of command saying, this is what we accomplished on this day. And other orders coming back down the chain of command and said, not good enough, do better. Do it faster, destroy more, do it more efficiently. And there's steady tinkering with the tactics to say this tactic works better than that tactic. It's more effective at eliminating the Kurdish identity. Even the ones who escaped, however, in many cases, were unable to rebuild. I want to show you a few slides. I won't comment on them. I want to show you the, the reality of what we're talking about. These are Kurdish villages, or what used to be Kurdish villages. In many of them, you will notice bomb craters. You will notice the hallmarks of military attacks, military shelling, which was often a precursor to the efforts to eliminate people. Villages, entire villages, <coughs> bulldozed under the ground. So as soon as the people were gone, their entire way of life was eliminated. Their businesses, their homes, uh, their schools, everything. Bulldozed, destroyed, utterly destroyed. You can see the concentrated, coordinated plan to destroy Iraqi way of life, Kurdish way of life. That's what happened in, to the occurred as a people. This is actually a return to almost medieval Middle Age thinking. Middle Age practices. Clearly none of this would, would be valid in a, in a war, under the laws and customs of war. But here, this is not an armed conflict. This is a, a government seeking to destroy a huge component of its own population. Remember, the Kurds were Kurds, but first and foremost, they were Iraqi. This is a regime attempting to destroy its own people. Prosecutor Munketh al Faroon, and I probably should have put in a picture of Prosecutor Munketh. He's a dear friend at this point. Prosecutor Munketh uh, is, a, is a wonderful example of the capacity building role uh, of the tribunal. Prosecutor Munketh has, has become a very, very polished, professional prosecutor. Here's what he said in his opening and his closing statement. Uh, as Ali Hassan, he, he made the point that Ali Hassan al-Majid and the other four defendants, the other four leading defendants, deserve the most harsh pun punishment. In this case, a capital sentence. Here's what he said. He said, they didn't have mercy on elderly people or women or children, not even on animals or the environment. In fact, he was speaking the truth. Even the birds suffered from the chemical weapons that floated on the clouds. And if you go into the villages after they've been destroyed, there are huge piles of bird bodies. Even the birds in the environment suffer under the Kurdish genocide. Family after family was torn apart across the whole swath of northern Iraq. There are accounts, uh, similar to some of the, some of the accounts from, from World War II, that only the caprice of a guard's whim led some people to live and some people to die, some people to stay together, some people to be separated, never to be seen again. But the point is that many times parents waited, not knowing what had happened to their son, or their spouse. There's one account of, of a young man who was forced to watch his sister be raped. He then came and testified at the trial to talk about what happened. Um, widows grieved. And the point, remember, is that all of this is an orchestrated, deliberate, coordinated policy of the Iraqi government. This is not renegade veins. This is not lawless rebels. This is the power of the Iraqi state being used to its fullest extent against the Kurdish people. The government drove busloads of civilians away, never to be seen again. These people were starved, they were raped, they were tortured, they were murdered, because they were Kurds. That, ladies and 
ladies and gentlemen, is the heart of genocide. You know of the infamy, many of you who have studied in this field know of the names from, from, from the World War II experience. Names like Auschwitz, and Dachau, and Treblinka. The names that call forth a flood of memory. In, a, in the Bosnian context, Celebici. If you haven't read the Celebici case and you're one of my students, you need to. Celebici, right up there with Auschwitz. Well, the Iraqi Kurdish experience added their own names to this list, this array. Names like Topsawa Prison, unspeakable horrors in Topsawa Prison. Places like Dibs, places like Nugrasama. Now there's a testimony in Nugrasama where, where inmates, families, now civilians, people like you and me, watched as the dogs came in the morning to dig up the bodies and eat them. People who had been killed in the night. Element of sheer luck was often the determinant uh, between who lived and who died. There's an account of, a, of an argument between two army officers over the proper line. There's lines for one, for one young boy. One line is going to be shot, one line is going to be imprisoned for a short period and then released. And there's one, two young lieutenants, one of whom knew the boy and physically put him in the life-saving line. And then one of the lieutenant's rivals pulled him very roughly and put him in the other line. And the young lieutenant, the kind young lieutenant, Iraqi Army lieutenant, went behind his peer, moved that boy and saved his life. Thousands of stories exactly like that. The first, what you might call experimental attacks, were, were in places called Sheikh Hassan and Bali Hassan. But they were only the first. That was the first use of chemical weapons. But they were experiments. What they were doing was refining the tactics and the techniques. The morning after the attacks in, in uh, Sheikh Wasan and Balasan, Iraqi soldiers entered the villages, they looted the homes, uh, army engineers came in, this, was, this was, became the common practice. They laid dynamite charges against the base of the walls and they destroyed the homes. It was easier to bulldoze them if the homes were already flat rather than trying to bulldoze them uh, uh, still standing. Just in those two villages alone, which were, all, which were ultimately bulldozed, as I, as I showed you. Somewhere between 200 and 400 villagers died. Among them, and this is documented, 33 children less than four years old. 28 children between the ages of five and 14. And many, many other elderly people who simply didn't have the mobility to escape and run away into the mountains. That is the face of genocide. That's what it looks like. So today, on-call survivors describe this primal fear. Uh, this, and, and, and in response to that primal fear, they developed an incredible resourcefulness. The will to live, the will to survive. Even as, as they were loaded on the buses or army trucks, and, and people were told, oh, it'll be okay, we're just moving you to a collective point. They knew deep down that something much more serious was going on. I want you to sort of uh, exercise, if you will, for me, uh, a flight of imagination. Put yourself in a Kurdish village. It's early morning, just after dawn. They, they come to the door and they say, you've got 20 minutes to leave. You, teenager, and man of the house, come with us. Fathers, you know, you'd gladly lay down your life to protect your children and your family. Most fathers would do that and not think twice about it. That's a fair trade. You make that choice when you have a family and a wife. Those fathers never got that chance. They were let off never to be seen again. They never knew what happened to their wives or their children or their family or their home or their business. The things that they had worked their entire life to build. The fathers, as they left, they told their young sons, be brave. Take care of your mother. Take care of your sisters. Tell them what has happened to me. Remember me. Remember what I tried to teach you. Mothers panicked but tried to stay cool on the outside. They tried to stay cool and collected. Because they didn't want to terrify the kids any more than necessary. Imagine if you were in that situation and told you had 20 minutes before you had, were forced to leave. What would you think of? You'd grab your medicine. You might grab your passport, your documentation. You might grab one thing that was special to you. You'd say to your children, take one thing that's special to you. One thing that reminds you of home. One thing that reminds you of who you are and where you come from. In a mass grave in Alhatra, we uncovered a small boy holding onto a red ball. 
that little boy, that red ball, was the one thing he could take and that was portable that he could carry with him that reminded him of home. The one toy that he could take wherever he was going. We found another young girl wearing what we call little duck boots. One little something to remind her of what her real life was like. I can't describe in great detail. I want to show you. And I hope this isn't too much. I hope this isn't overkill. But I want to show you what this place was like. This is a place called Nineveh. You can see it's out in the desert. This is not a place that you stumble into. This is a place that manifests by its very location, organized, concentrated, coordinated, planned. You have to have a, a specified place to round up Kurdish victims to take them to. This is where the mass grave is, this one mass grave. This mass grave, by the way, is exactly the width to the inch of an Iraqi military bulldozer. Exactly the width of an Iraqi military bulldozer. This is how you prove genocide. Here's the, the documentation, the layout of the mass grave. In this particular mass grave, no males, all women and children. We find many other mass graves of nothing but men and boys. This particular mass grave, um, lots and lots of forensic evidence. Bullet wounds to the back of the head as the cause of death. Over and over and over again. This is a full-term pregnant woman. Exhumed from the mass grave along with the fetus. This is, what, this is what, what one victim looked like in the mass grave. You can see the very sophisticated forensics work, the forensics documentation. This is the kind of detail that takes to prove a genocide case. This is a young boy. This is what he looked like when he was exhumed. Note the hand, the larger hand. When they exhumed him, they unwrapped the blanket, they began to panic because they found this hand. They said, well, what's that? That's going to... That's gonna, call into question the legal validity of our evidence. When they exhumed his mother next to him, she was missing her right hand. She died with her hand inside his blanket, next to the boy, comforting, trying to comfort the, boy, comfort the child. That's why when they unwrapped the blanket from the boy, they found her hand. There's his blanket. And imagine the mother saying, take your favorite blanket with you, the one that I handmade for you, the one that I worked on for so long. Take it with you, because we don't know where we're going. Take one thing that reminds you of home. The graves are also overwhelmingly full of Kurdish clothing, Kurdish ethnic objects, Kurdish jewelry. That's how you prove a genocide case. 28 week old fetus. One of the men that was uncovered. Notice the ligatures over the eye. Or the, the remains of the ligatures over the eyes. Many, many bullet wounds, of course, apart from the specific cause of death, which shows not just one round, but a hail of gunfire, a hail of rounds. I could show hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of those pictures because there were thousands and thousands of victims. Now, the theme of this series is broken silence. And I thought about that as I thought about it. In a sense, that's ironic to me. Because in those moments of death, in those moments when Iraqi Kurds were hauled away from their homes, there was no quiet. This was not the quiet, passive surrender of a defeated people. This was chaos. This was shooting. This was shouting. This was orders. There was a lot of noise. There was a lot of violence. And in the moment of death, as the Iraqi soldiers lined them up on the edges of the mass grave, there was crying, there was screaming, there was shouting, there was shooting. There was no silence. That all ended, of course, quickly, as we, as we might surmise, with the silence of death. One look at the map, even the map shows you that this campaign was widespread or systematic. Those are the hallmarks of the crime against humanity. Widespread or systematic. So you might say to yourself, well, look, that's what we mean when we say ethnic cleansing as a crime against humanity. Why reach for genocide? The standard is high. You're going to get convictions anyway. You can prove widespread or systematic, objectively, scientifically, with easily available evidence. Why reach for genocide? Isn't it sufficient to do justice with 
a criminal conviction, no matter what you call it? In this context, I would argue no. Because the Kurdish people themselves said and knew that they had suffered from genocide. To call it less than what it was and to prosecute it for less than what it was would have said to that group of people, we don't validate your experience. We don't recognize the suffering in legal terms and call it for what it was. Now I want to focus for a little bit uh, on the contributions of the trial that has just concluded. Uh, one of the subtle contributions of the genocide trial that just concluded has been to refine and to reshape the specific legal language that we use to describe genocidal intent. As I said, it's dole specialis, it's a specific, specified intent. In every criminal case, though, that intent has to be inferred. In this case, it's inferred from a number of factors, and this case represents the most modern, current, complete articulation of how you document that specific legal intent in the language of the law based on the available facts. Here's how we did it. Number one, the physical targeting of the group. Every Kurd in northern Iraq was targeted. How do you know they were the target? Because the regime branded them, the regime labeled them. The Kurds themselves were targeted for physical destruction. It was, that was accompanied by the use of derogatory language, slang language, that said, you really don't have the right to exist. We will call you whatever we want to call you. We will degrade your right to exist because, the inference is, our intent, our desire is to destroy you as a group. The weapons employed, this was not random casual violence. As I said, this was concerted, coordinated efforts. Uh, the methodical planning, the systematic nature of the killing. And in fact, in this context, you actually have to turn it around. There was a Kurdish decree, or, uh, an Iraqi decree that went out and said, everything in that area is the prohibited zone. If you are in that prohibited zone, you are subject to death. So the defense says, look, we weren't trying to destroy Kurds. We were simply kind of trying to, as a military pragmatic reason, destroy everything in that zone. We had military reasons for doing it. That negates the special intent. I turned that around, however, and I asked them, can you show any evidence whatsoever that those targeted populations were based on anything other than Kurdish identity? And the fact is, there is no evidence of that. Specifically, the relevant facts and circumstances include the context, uh, the perpetration of similar acts across a wide scale of planning, uh, the focus on a particular group, and, and this is key, the repetition of particularly destructive acts. There's lots of the military correspondence, as I said, that said, this tactic is effective. There's lots of other admonishments that say, you are behind schedule. You were supposed to have destroyed 12 villages yesterday, but you only did seven. You better step it up. There was disciplinary action that flowed. And conversely, one of the hallmarks of true genocide in Balkans and in Iraq and in other contexts has been the affirmative rewards given to military and intelligence leaders. Saddam Hussein handed out medals for these genocidal acts, for these campaigns. Here actually is where I find the theme of this conference slightly ironic and actually betrayed by the physical evidence. Broken silence is the theme of the conference. In fact, from the mass graves themselves, the testimony that emerged from the mass graves was powerful and loud and thunderous, and absolutely persuasive. The voices of the victims echoed in the stories of the relatives and in their memories. The big thing was the mass graves themselves spoke with thundering clarity. Here's a mass grave with 500 people in it, every one of whom is a Kurd. We know that because of the Kurdish identity, because of the Kurdish clothing, because of the Kurdish jewelry. In fact, some of the most powerful testimony from the mass graves came in the form of identification. How do we know that this was a planned, deliberate policy? Well, here are Kurdish names from respective villages that happened to be assembled at the same time in the same place on the same day to be murdered pursuant to the specific planning of the regime. That's genocide. That powerful trial testimony came from the mass graves themselves. That's why this was genocide in its classic, classic sense. Now I want to make a couple of historical legal, legal observations here, just to put this in context, and then I'll, I'll leave you time for questions. 
As was alluded to earlier, Raphael Lemkin's classic 1944 book coined the term genocide. Here's the name of the book. Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, Laws of Occupation, Analysis of Government, and I like this, Proposals for Redress. And it was in chapter 9 that coined that term genocide for the first time in international practice. Oh, by the way, in passing, I sound like the lawyer that says, Your Honor, I only have two more questions. This one doesn't count. This is another observation, not one of my two. In the Iraqi tribunal process, there's a specific article, I believe it's Article 24, that says that the bench, the panel, has the right to require forfeiture of all assets of the defendants. Striking to me, because Raphael Lemkin's original proposal back in 1944 was uh, avenues for redress. This tribunal ordered forfeiture of those defendants, of their homes and their property that was directly or indirectly obtained. And the point of that is to go back to Kurdish victims, Kurdish families. And I will tell you, one of the most heated exchanges in the entire trial was the day the judge said that from the bench. Defendants rose to their feet in anger and said, you can't do that. This is persecution. It's unfair. The judge said, sit down. That's the law. It's right in our statute. Let me make my point. He says that genocide, Raphael Lemkin, uh, said that genocide was aimed, at, as, as I said, at those fixed and defined immutable characteristics of group. Raphael's actual concept, though, went a bit broad. What he wanted to prosecute was not just the physical destruction and the biological destruction of groups. What he wanted to prosecute was a much broader array of, of cultural and, and social and moral and religious persecution. It was a much broader concept. What he, what he actually focused on, as I've said, did not make it into the Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention focuses on the physical destruction of the group or the acts seeking to, to, to destroy the group. The Lemkin genocide wasn't just a crime against humanity, it was a crime against nations. The Iraqi jurist in this case, however, in the language of the, of the trial judgment, there's a lot of language about the status of genocide and what happened to the Kurds, not just in physical, raw, legal terms, but in moral terms. That judgment really represents a statement of moral principle on the part of the trial chamber, really to the Kurdish people as an ethnic group, as an identity. It said, yes, you are Kurds, but in fact, you were Iraq. And it really serves that purpose. That's the, the intent of the trial panel, was to make that specific statement and move the onus of the crime away from the exclusive focus on mass murder to a much broader concept aiming at, and here's the key, the protection of ethnic identity. That's the language of the judgment. That's why this judgment, in its first legal sense, is, is really important. It's a milestone. Second thing is, I think, much more important than the proactive. Many times we say, why can't we prevent this? Why can't we stop this in the future? Some of you may have heard the phrase, never again. Never again will allow this. Lincoln's point, Lincoln's book, if you really look at it, is a compendium, a very detailed description of the legal and administrative rules that the, the, the Nazis used to persecute people. It's got a 400-page appendix. And in, in that 400-page appendix, is translations uh, of the legal rules. Genocide, as postulated by Raphael Lincoln, actually originated in the law. And this is a very, very important insight. Students of German history can study what they call the Nazi socialist state of injustice, of Deutsch in his And all this is is a welter of formal, administrative, and legal and regulatory mechanisms, very complex thicket of law designed to persecute a people. And here's the point. Nine Germans under the Third Reich, there's about a, over a thousand page book on my shelf that describes in excruciating detail the processes of law used to persecute people. And here's the point. Far from being laws, genocide itself to be implemented and to carry out requires law for its successful implementation. That's what the Iraqis did. Saddam Hussein passed and issued what was called Revolutionary Command Account, Decree Number 160. Decree Number 160 
gain to these are examples of the, of the distinctively Kurdish clothing and jewelry that was found. Here's what Decree 160 did. It gave the full power of Saddam's tyrannical regime to Ali Hassan al-Majid. It's that Ali Hassan al-Majid, in as the leader of the Northern Bureau, Ali Hassan al-Majid is a concentrated focal point for all the power of the Iraqi state. In other words, the genocide originated in law. It originated in the legal structures and the power of the state. Ali, uh, Revolutionary Decree 160 was carried out with chillingly clear precision and chillingly clear plan. Here's the language. Ali Hassan al-Majid has full authority and privilege to issue commands binding on all civil, military, and government security institutions. All of the back party policy officials, all of the intelligence bureaucracy, all of the interagency, all of the police, all of the military reported to one man who in turn exercised a concentrated, coordinated conception of genocide that they then carried out. And, and again, I reiterate the point, genocide originated in the law. It's not just a lawless act of lawless renegades. It originated in the law. And that's where those two early morning attacks, as early as April 1987, took place in those two villages. The very first attacks, victims vomited from the chemical weapons that were used. According to the file, they, the Ba'ath Party officials, because this was an experiment, they were interested in following up the medical effects. They took them to a hospital. Um, the doctors called the military hospital after several days. The military then came from the civilian hospital and said, we will take these people because we want to observe them. They took them to the military hospital. Some of the doctors and nurses who had first treated those people became concerned. And they called the military hospital to check up on the status of their patients. And they were told, they're not here. They never were here. They don't exist. You must have imagined it. What ended up happening in that particular attack, the very first attack, was that some of the civilian doctors and nurses hid the victims, and sometimes in their own homes, so they could provide adequate medical because they knew that the state was conspiring to, to destroy those people. And they wanted to protect them. So here we stand after a lengthy trial that has laid out genocide in its classic form. The unfold genocide was ultimately based on race, religion, ethnicity, and culture. All the grounds that form a classic state of genocide. We look back on this judgment, and for my Impression. This judgment breaks the silence. It documents and provides the authoritative, definitive historical record of what happened during the Omnia. It breaks the silence and documents that for all of history. So tonight, I want to add our voices to those who testified at trial and those whose presence was felt. As a group, I hope that we all concur with those witnesses. From the ovens of Auschwitz, here's what they said. They said, Shuldi, meaning guilty. From the hill country of Bosnia, they said, free, guilty, Serbo Croatia. From the bloody, bloody riverbeds of Rwanda, they're in the Rwanda genocide. Kupabu, uh, guilty, Kobe, Kupabu. From the arid deserts of Darfur today, Musni, guilty. From that courtroom, forever and always, the phrase is, Mufsidin. Evil do, sin, genocide. That's what those defendants have been labeled now by the force of law, by the force of that opinion. They committed the crime of crimes, and that pronouncement will echo through the region and, and be memorialized in the jurisprudence for all time now. One of the Iraqi judges said to me one time, he said, Do you think they will read our opinions the way they read the Nuremberg opinions? And the answer is yes, provided you provide the quality authoritative, definitive opinion. That's what that 963-page judgment does. I thank you for your time and for your attention, and I think we've got time for questions.
covered by Kurdish community. First, Dr. Newton, uh, I would like to express uh, our thanks, I really appreciate it for your hard job. Exactly this happened for Kurdish community. This is a, a small sample of the genocide of Kurdish in the north of Iraq, in Kurdistan. Uh, I have been in Halabsha during 1998. I am from Halabsha city. I, I have so by myself, but I sat in Halabsha. And in here we had a gallery regarding the Ankara operation and regarding the Halabsha. Uh, Halabsha bombarded by the Iraqi regimes. And I would like to extend our invitation <coughs> to you, to the students, to who want to, who, uh, to show them these documents who had uh, any questions regarding the Anfars. And I would like to cooperate with you uh, regarding this matter. Thank you so much. Yes, and we will take you up on that, because Halabja will be prosecuted, as I say. I do believe it. So, yes, ma'am. Who will be the defendant that will be prosecuted for the Halabja case and everyone that caused the genocide is basically gone now? I would not say everyone. Remember, the full orchestrated power of the state. And this is, you hand it one of the classic problems. In the early days when I asked the Iraqis as we designed the court, how many do you want to prosecute? Without the point, without a hesitation, they said thousands. Well, I know from my experience, and the experience in the Balkans, and the experience in Sierra Leone, and the experience in East Timor, you're not going to prosecute thousands in that set. The, the Sierra Leone phraseology is those who bear the greatest responsibility. So in this first trial, those who bear the greatest responsibility, the leading tier, have been prosecuted. There are plenty of others to take their place. Plenty of others. <coughs> and, but remember, it's always easy from the outside to say, well, so-and-so should have been prosecuted, and so-and-so should be in this case, but not that case. This is always evidence-dependent. It's always, as one Iraqi jurist said to me one time, in our system, only the evidence speaks. So that's what will happen. They will, they will base their assessment on the available evidence and the proper compilation of that evidence and prosecute the people that are prosecutable. But there may very well be another, a second, on fall two, if you will. But it's up to your act. Yes, sir. My name is uh, Lockman, and on behalf of me and my family and all the Kurdish community, actually, we would like to say thank you. Thank you for your uh, great information that you provided to uh, those who uh, didn't know what happened in those days, actually. As one of the Kurdish who experienced some of these uh, previously, uh, uh, I want to ask you a question, doctor. Uh, from your experience as a law person or specialist, uh, as you know, as, as a result of this, all this uh, uh, happened to the Kurdish people, there is thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands of people who left behind these families who they still suffer from injuries, physical injuries, or mentally they get uh, uh, affected by. Uh, and also there is, uh, in Halabcha itself, uh, we have somebody who experienced uh, those days who are sitting in this room right now. Uh, there's thousands of people who suffer from cancer, heart disease, different, uh, different disease. Uh, what's the legal way for those people who can fight to get some of their right from, and who, who they can uh, complain to, how they can get their right, uh, some, of, some of their right. At least have somebody to say, we, we apologize, yeah. we, you know. Uh, well, the, one of the men that stood up in court and apologized, I think that's a first step. Those who didn't apologize have been sentenced to capital sentences. That's a first step. That's an important step. But as I said, one of the important factors, at least in this first round of defendants, was that all their assets were seized. Now, that's a pit. It's a tiny fraction of the funds necessary. But those funds are available to go back into Iraqi civil court and, what we would say, attach those funds, take part of those funds for available uh, so what, I, what the next round of litigation will be, Iraqi lawyers going into Iraqi civil courts to attach, to get part of portions of those funds for victims. And, and that's why there will be more trials. But there are funds be being made available for precisely that reason. Now, would it have been better to have those funds 20 years ago? Certainly. But, you know, we do what we can. Now, a question from a student. Yes, sir. 
a new and revitalized and restored Iraqi judicial system. However, here's the big lesson learned. A trial process itself, or the restoration of the rule of law, cannot bear the way of bringing peace and stability in its own right to the broader society. The trial itself, despite its early aspirations, broke down in the midst of sustained, orchestrated societal violence. You've got to bring peace, then justice. That's the lesson learned. Because in that courtroom, I will give you book, chapter, and verse, those were fundamentally fair trials in the courtroom. The problem was the cloud of perception outside the courtroom didn't allow good faith people to watch and observe and really understand it. And I could tell you a long time about these people. So, yes, sir. Yes, I'd like to ask you an opinion about how far do we go back when we start looking into what motivated or how a genocide is enacted. For example, in this particular case, we are talking about 1987, 1988. Yes. And Saddam Hussein's regime was not able to produce the weaponry and the material that was used for it. He was not in a position to survive without having help from outside power or, or government agency that allowed him to do that, or at least accepted it or did not protest against it, did not say anything. How much can we say people really are obligated to try to not just stop, but try to, 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 to punish someone when they do it, when they do it at that particular time? As it happens, late 1980s, Saddam Hussein was still very strongly in favor of many governments in the West. Right. Uh, good question. And in fact, that, that question is answered to some extent as a purely legal matter. You always have to separate the politics. Because we can talk about the politics and the morality. That's a separate discussion. But your question was on the legal issue. Um, there was a Dutch trial in, in, in the Netherlands of a Dutch businessman who had sold the chemical weapons used in those villages. And the question was, can we convict that businessman of the crime of genocide? Or the crime of complicity in genocide? And it comes down to a very technical legal answer, you go back to the specific intent. Intent to eliminate dos specialis. My intent to eliminate, whole or in part, a group of people based on racial, ethnic, national, religious characterization, and remember, a few key words, as such. What's that Dutch businessman's motivation when it really comes down to it? It's to make money. <coughs> Profits. So the Dutch court said, we can't reach, as a matter of law, the determination that that person shared the genocidal intent. That's step A. Step B is just the next step removed from that that says, if you don't have the genocidal intent, but you help those people that do have the genocidal intent, what do we call that? In genocide law, we call that complicity. In some cases, you might call it aiding and abetting. That's the genesis of the conviction. But it's based on not that special intent. You don't share that intent yourself, but there's evidence that you know of their intent. And this sounds like my class. My students are saying, stop. Please, stop. <laughs> but that's what's necessary. Somebody, some group, a policymaker, does possess the requisite genocidal intent. You're guilty of complicity when you know of that intent and you facilitate that. You assist it in some material way. Well, it's an end discussion meeting exactly to try to find, in this particular case, whether there was complicity on the part of others. Is it going to be followed up? Will there be? If there's evidence of that, as far as I know, there's no other evidence uh, surfacing. I know of one other case that I think was in Germany uh, along the same lines of complicity. Um, but as far as I know right now, there's no other good, tangible evidence of that out there. Um, I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. I don't know your Oh, it's totally up to you. Okay, two more. One student and one in the back row. Y'all decide. Yes, sir. Uh, I also want to add, uh, you know, add my appreciation for your assistance in this matter. And, uh, my question is, uh, what do you propose to occurs in the West or anyone in the West to pursue to assist the uh, Alaska case? I'm not sure. I just run that by me again. What do you what do you uh, propose that or would you say that the Kurds or anyone here in the West uh, what do we what should we do to assist the Halafi case? 
Number two, there's a clear pathway to provide that to the tribunal. I can't tell you when the Halabja case will be prosecuted in relation to the other investigations. But what I can tell you is this, because I've seen them do this. The Iraqis have a very, almost chaotic process of collecting evidence. You never quite know what's happening, what the status of a case is. Uh, but there is an investigative judge assigned to each case. And really, the sequence of cases is determined partly by political factors, partly by the availability of, of witnesses, but in reality, when the case is ready, it will be prosecuted. So to the extent that Kurdish groups outside Iraq can facilitate that investigative judge feeling ready for trial, uh, in Iraqi law it's called a situation. When that situation in its entirety has been documented and sufficiently to go to trial, it will go to trial. That's what they can do to help the investigative judge link up with Iraqi officials. So last question from the back row. My name is Kirman Gundi. I'm a Kurdish American and associate professor at Tennessee State University. I want to thank you for your well prepared, thoughtful, and to the point presentation. Uh, you mentioned everything related to the Enfad and Halabja. And the perpetrator, of course, as you know, they have been found guilty and sentenced to death. But apparently, it's not been carried out because. outspoken person happened to be the president of Iraq who happened to be a Kurd himself. But there are beliefs among the many Kurdish sectors, uh, sects with uh, sectors that America is behind this. Because I think they want to save the life of a uh, former Iraqi defense minister who received many medals from Saddam Hussein for destroying the Kurdish uh, villages. He is a Sunni guy. Yes. And I think they are trying to appease Sunnis by, there are something, for us it doesn't make sense, we don't understand why. I understand, let me tell uh, you. Why they, and they, since, <laughs> based on all the evidence, they basically were involved in Kirikel Ali, who uh, yes. was the first guy in, in charge in Kurdistan for destroying the whole, some 4,500 villages. Uh, there, their uh, sentence is not carried out as a speedy way as it was for Saddam Hussein. Yes. Let me explain it to you. And you may or may not believe me, but this is the truth. And in fact, for those Kurds in the room, if there are rumors that this is like American power, that this is some ulterior American motive, that's rubbish. Demonstrably false. Let me explain it to you in legal terms. And also for the benefit of my students, how many first year law students are there that have ever heard of a case called Marbury versus Madison? How many second year law students have ever heard of Marbury versus Madison? <laughs> right? the, the on call appeal in the Iraqi system is the Iraqi Marbury versus Madison. And then, which is really a question of the competing power of the various branches of the Iraqi government. Now, let me say this as simply as I can and, and accurately to, to really, I want to convince you if I can that in fact there is no conspiracy, there is no American power, there is no. American official deciding this. This is a matter of Iraqi law and Iraqi politics. Here are the three steps. The Iraqi tribunal statute says, as do the other international tribunal statutes, that appeals are grounded in the appeals chamber of that tribunal. So the ICTY appeals process is in the ICTY. The ICTR appeals process is in the ICTR appeals judges, which happen to be the same group. But nevertheless, the statute, there's no external appeal beyond that group. That's what the Iraqi tribunal statute says. Then it says a couple of important things. It says that, well, three important things. It says that there's no external appeal. Uh, a sentence that approves, an appeal that approves a capital sentence must be executed within 30 days. The appeals came down from the appeals chamber on the 5th of September. So do the math. 5th of, the 5th of October would have been 30 days. And so you're right, 30 days have passed. What's happening? And then there's a third important provision that says no Iraqi official can commute death sentences. There's no way, and that, that's, that makes sense because the effort is to take the politics out. Right, it's a matter of law and process, it's not a matter of politics and power. So those are the things in the Iraqi statute. 
Here's the problem. There's a superior provision of Iraqi criminal procedure law that says the federal court is the ultimate determinant and authority of constitutional issues. There's a provision of the Iraqi Constitution that says no capital sentence may be executed without the signature of all three presidents. So you're right. One of the presidents, in this case occurred, says I don't want to sign because I oppose capital sentences. So which is, which is dominant? Which is, the, which is the predominant rule? Is it the Iraqi Constitutional rule that says all three have to consent and sign? Or is it the Iraqi Statute rule? which is a statutory rule passed by the sovereign Iraqi government. And here's why this case is important. The federal constitutional court just ruled last week as a matter of law. This is not American politics. This is not Western politics. The Iraqi court, the court of cassation, ruled that it's the constitutional rule that predominates. That's why this is the Iraqi Marbury versus Madison. It's a question of allocation of powers. It's a question of interpreting the constitution for the Iraqi. So it's really a question of law. It's a technical question of law, I grant you. But it's a question of law. So until the Iraqi courts, maybe they need to want to change their constitution. That's their prerogative. But until they do so, there's a valid judgment in place in their own system that prevents the immediate ex execution of those sentences. We'll see how it resolves itself. But right now, just as in Marbury versus Madison, you've got a collision of different branches of the Iraqi legal system. We'll see how it comes out. So thank you very, very much, all of you, for your time and, and for your generosity and for your attention. This is a late night, particularly for you students. So thank you.